Well, the basic signal processing framework is as I've illustrated on this slide here, and this encompasses a wide range of problems that we'll be considering. And that is we have an input, some signal is an input, we have a system which is acting on that input somehow, and then we have an output. So for example, on the input side, I might have uh, a um, desired signal and it might be noisy. So I've got noise that's been added in somehow along the, along the way. Maybe it's a microphone and the environment has lots of background noise or something like that. And then what I would do is develop some filter to attenuate the noise and at this point I have a clean copy of the signal. Okay, so my system is the filter that's taking care of the uh, uh, noise attenuation for me. So that's just an example of how this might work. Now there's within this framework we have three different classic signal processing problems and depending on what part of this uh, three component system here depending on what is known and what's not known we have three different problems so for example let's suppose we are given the input x of n and the output uh, y of n and we want to find the system that produced those this is called system identification because we want to identify a system that's responsible for generating a certain relationship between an input and an output. So in this case, the, on the left we know the input, on the right we know the output, we just don't know what's in the middle. So a second example, or a second problem that arises within this framework is let's suppose we're given x of n and h, then what we want to do is compute or find y of n. And uh, this is often referred to as filtering. And in fact, uh, the example I just mentioned a minute ago where we have a noisy signal and then we apply a filter to it to get a clean signal. In that case, I know the input. It's my signal and my noise. I know what the system. It's some filter I've designed to get rid of noise. And I just need to find out what is the output. Okay, so there we know uh, the uh, two things on the left. Uh, here the input and we know the, the system we just don't know what the output is over here on the right. So the third problem obviously is when we are given the output and the system but we don't know what the input was and so we want to find the input x of n. And this problem is typically called uh, equalization it's sometimes called an inverse problem because we want to go backwards. We're given the output. We want to put the output backwards through the system to figure out what input would have resulted in that particular output. Now, all three of these problems are in play when you make a cell phone call. Okay, so what's happening is the signal that goes from your uh, cell phone here and... Um, Let's pretend we have some an old-style phone with actual buttons on it and so on. Well, what happens is a signal from this phone transmits through the um, environment, and you're in a room, you're in a building, you're in a car, and the environment distorts the waveform that you transmit. So at the receiving antenna, say at the base station, we receive a distorted version of the signal that was transmitted from the cell phone. And so what we want to do, first of all, the base station wants to figure out what was the effect of the system that was uh, the transmission, you know, what was H? H is the effect of the transmission from your phone to the base station. So it's modeling the electromagnetic propagation and the distortion that occurs with the system. and you'd say, well, but it doesn't know what the input was. Well, your, your phone uses some uh, uh, known sequences before it transmits data. It uses things that are known at both ends so that it does know and then it measures. Anyway, it figures out what the system was. Then 
what it does is it, in essence, it uses the knowledge of that system to, to equalize. In other words, to take what it receives here as y of n, right? It gets y of n, and we're, of course, greatly simplifying things. But we transmit x of n, it gets distorted, we get y of n, and then um, it gets processed somehow in the base station, and that processing, let's just call this h inverse, that processing, the goal of that is to give back x of n. Now it turns out that there's also a filtering taking place in the, uh, for, for example, in the RF section of your phone where your antenna is picking up all sorts of signals and you're going to use a filter to limit it to the frequency ranges that your calls are going to come in. For example, we could look at an image processing problem and in this case we've got some photo that we want to capture and uh, we have our little stick figure person which is about the best I can do. The problem is is someone's shaking or the uh, camera is uh, not focused properly and what happens is we get a uh, blurry version of this of this person. Okay, we don't see we see just some blurry stuff here. The details have been lost in the process because of the, the blurring and it's not a very sharp picture at all. Now in this case we can think of the original image as the input and this is the output and this is our system here which is uh, blurring things. And so if we can perhaps somehow figure out what the blurring was, we can model the blurring as some system. So that's the system identification problem. We figure out what the blur was somehow. And then we have this equalization or this inverse problem where what we would like to do is design an inverse system or a system that undoes H, reverses it, to get back the um, nice sharp image. This is sometimes called image restoration. Okay? And actually this happened with the uh, Hubble telescope. When it first went up, the mirror was not ground properly. And after spending all this money and so on, we, we got back these blurry images. They ended up sending up a, a mission to fix the problem, but in the meantime, they were able to discern what the nature of the problem was with the mirror and find a suitable inverse system that undid the blurring introduced by the mirror and there by the improperly ground mirror and therefore we were able to get still get usable uh, high quality images until the tell us, you know until that problem was corrected on a later shuttle mission this is quite common in signal processing that we have these three components we have an input some kind of system and we have an output Sometimes the, this is a model for what's happening physically as here where we're taking a picture and we're assuming this blurring is modeled by some system and then we also in other cases we have an actual device our signal processing system is what what we're using here applying to the input signal so that would be the second line here where we have an actual signal processing system that is designed to manipulate the data. In this case, our blurry signal here is considered the input to the second system, and hopefully we recover a, a nice sharp image. All right, so that's a basic framework for DSP. Sometimes we use these concepts of systems and so on to model the physics of what's happening, and other times it's the computation that we're implementing to manipulate the signals ourselves. So the classical or basic system has some continuous time signal x of t that's out there in the physical world and that's going to go into an so-called analog to digital converter which takes the continuous time signal and among other things uh, it does is it produces a discrete time output call that x of n and then we have our discrete time system here, 
use just a, a G here. And this would be implemented typically with some with a computer or a, a, a chip or whatever. And then in general, that might need to be converted back to a continuous time signal. So we'll have a, a D to A converter here. And uh, this takes it from digital form back to analog or continuous time. So we'll call this Y of N. And we'll call this out here Y of T. And this is this whole, if I, I put a box around this. So that's a basic DSP system. Now I've drawn this with time as the independent variable, but it can just as well be space as is an image, um, or sometimes we might have multiple antennas like in a cell phone system or a phased array radar, um, and so on. There's lots of different uh, dimensions here, but usually these are involved. And so this is going to be the main focus of our course this semester, we're going to be looking at the effects of analog to digital conversion and what constraints we need on this for this to be meaningful. We're going to look at different types of systems that we could put in here and then we'll also look at the effect of converting from digital back to analog. So for example, let's say you're going to um, you're going to play an mp3 file okay, and to listen to the sound. Well Somebody in concert, probably, perhaps, or in a studio, recorded an analog signal. Okay, there was a voice that's that's a continuous pressure variation that was sensed by a microphone. It was then converted into discrete time format, perhaps uh, filtered and coded a bunch of other things before it ends up in MP3 format. Then, so somewhere in in the middle here of this, we've got our um, on this side, we've got our MP3 coding, and then on the other side, we've got our uh, decoding to produce back a signal. Okay, so maybe your iPod is in here, or your cell phone, or whatever you use to play music, and um, that decodes to a series of samples. Now, these would be like samples on a CD, a compact disc, for those of you that have seen those. Uh, and then those get converted back to an analog signal, which can be amplified and put out through a speaker that you can listen to, headphones or, or a loudspeaker. Okay, so this is basic DSP, and this is pretty common. And our goals are to understand, particularly this semester, and we're going to we're going to do some image processing, but we're going to focus a lot on the the time case. We're going to look at the analog to digital conversion process. We're going to look at the um, discrete time systems and how we design filters and then we'll look also at converting back to analog signals.